Hello friends and family and welcome to the Saturday edition of the Crippling Anxiety Meditation Fireside Chat. Today I wanted to talk about a book that I'm reading. The book is uh, Bashai Turu by Mahashweta Devi and um, it is only sort, sort of by Mahashweta Devi. She wrote the original Bengali version. I'm reading a translation and it's quite a difficult book to translate as the translators um, describe in the beginning because there are all sorts of very subtle, uh, nuanced um, details in the language itself, in the Bengali that uh, the different characters are speaking. And the translators did their best to bring this across into English, but it's extremely difficult um, to do so in the English speaking world. I don't think that there are um, as subtle or as nuanced dialects um, as it sounds like there are in uh, Bengali or certainly there were in um, the 60s and 70s in Bengal. Um, and it uh, is extremely difficult for me to speak directly to the ideas expressed in this book because they are extremely foreign to me. Um, so the, the concepts are about um, what was lumped together as the Naxalite movement. And um, it's essentially the most oppressed, the most hard done by in the population um, rising up against their oppressors. And um, the book got me thinking about, uh, about people in this position. So the descriptions given um, leave leave little space for any kind of privilege for these people. The idea um, in the 70s, as it's conveyed by Mahashweti Devi, um, is that the people were so oppressed, systematically oppressed, that it was impossible for them to own land, it was po impossible for them to rent land, and in many cases, it was impossible for them to even find work systematically. So they were pushed out of society in such a way that they had to continuously wander and that they couldn't really find possessions for themselves. They couldn't find any sort of stability. And it's hard to imagine uh, such a level of oppression. And it is difficult to really uh, to reconcile uh, mentally for um, any of us in uh, the positions that we hold. But it did get me thinking about the, the, universi the universality of certain access. So um, one aspect is the idea of the minimum wage, which was put into law in 1968. And the book describes the many, many ways in which the administration, the various forms of government, um, and the jotedars, the, the landowners, and the money lenders, how they would take advantage of the system and avoid paying the minimum wage. Um, and it really uh, highlights this idea that it is very possible for the systems on paper to break down completely and that the, the real systems are the, the systems of reality. What is actually happening on the ground? Is anyone starving? Is anyone impoverished? Um, is anyone oppressed? 
because the laws do not necessarily provide um, what they are supposed to to these people. And the reason that this is relevant to meditation um, is because there is an aspect to meditation that I have given a lot of thought to, and that is the universality of meditation, the accessibility of meditation. And in uh, the first few years that I was meditating, I kept evaluating different techniques and evaluating them on uh, different criteria. And I would think to myself, um, well, of course, what is the right med meditation technique for me? Because I would like to find one technique and work hard with that one technique. And uh, certainly I probably won't master it in this lifetime, but I would like to become well-established in a technique and make good use of it um, for myself and for others within the scope of my lifetime. It's a, uh, a lifetime work to meditate. And as I became more established with Vipassana meditation specifically, uh, which begins with Anapan, they're sort of uh, two sides of the same coin, if you will, um, it became apparent to me that a necessary criterion for evaluating meditation techniques was um, that of universal access. And that um, once I was familiar with a meditation technique such that I was certain that it was the meditation technique that I wanted to work on every day and that I wanted to really dedicate a lot of time and energy into, um, I needed to be certain that that meditation technique was accessible to others. And this was actually what gave me pause about some of the other meditation techniques I found valuable, was that I found them valuable, but I came across those meditation techniques in uh, commercial environments. So even if the costs of attending a retreat or um, visiting a zendo or uh, taking a course of some sort were only the bare minimum costs um, to cover the expenses of the course or to cover the expenses of the meals at the zendo and the, the room and board and all that, um, even if it was only the bare minimum costs, these people, the, <laughs> the agricultural laborers of Bashai Turu, um, could not afford that meditation at all. Uh, they could barely afford to feed themselves. And um, there are people in comparable positions today that... Uh, do not have these freedoms, do not have the disposable income even just to cover the basics because they may not be getting the basics uh, in their regular day-to-day. -day. And I think that this is, um, first of all, an indication of a good technique, good for some abstract notion of good, but uh, a good measurement for the value of the technique is that as I do it, I find, oh, this is useful. Oh, this is really useful. More people should be doing this. This is a really useful thing. And you keep thinking that to yourself, oh, this, this is really, would be really good for other people. They should be doing this as well. Um, and it's just a a background noise um, which happens, which is this idea that um, this thing is valuable. And of course, you have this feeling with so many aspects of your life. You think, oh, this tool is valuable. This book is valuable. Oh, everyone should read this book. It's a very good book. Um, but upon the fourth or fifth reading of the book, you might find that the, the value is decreasing, decreasing, the absolute value of 
reading the book is decreasing. And uh, it is this quality of meditation, um, and it is a quality of all meditation techniques that I've tried thus far, as far as I've explored them, that they do not have the limitations of sensory entertainments. So, uh, of course, drugs and alcohol and sex and all of these things. But even television and uh, going to the cinema, whatever it is that we do to distract ourselves from the difficulties of life, meditation doesn't behave in that same way. So if we watch TV as a distraction, we will find that sooner or later it stops being a valuable distraction. And so we need to watch more TV or we need to find TV which is more potent <laughs> uh, or um, which scratches a different itch. And meditation is always kind of the same. I mean, it's always changing, but you come back to it and it's always just watching the breath coming in and going out. There's, there's never a new color that is added to that. Um, you never get version three of Anapan meditation. It's the same as it's been for thousands of years. So this is an inherently valuable quality of meditation, that it doesn't go stale. So that's good. And then once you find that because it doesn't go stale, you keep revisiting the meditation and it continues to have value. And if you're doing it continuously, it has more value and more value and more value the more that you're practicing. And even if you're not doing it continuously, you might find that whenever you come back to the meditation, you sort of have this, this you're given this kick. <laughs> oh, right. That's why I was meditating. Oh, it, has a, it has this value to it. it. It changes the way that I think. It changes the way that I behave. I become a much more sensible person when I'm meditating. Ah, yes, meditation is valuable. Um, these characteristics are the sort of foundation of a valuable meditation, that it is always valuable, that you will always find value in it. And then there's this kind of structure which is built on top, which is that you really want other people to experience the value that you have found in that same meditation. And in a different way, than a high quality book. Oh, okay, there's a very good book, wonderful. I give it a good review and I tell my friends and family about it and yeah, yeah, the book is, is worth reading and I encourage you. Maybe I even buy it for someone for Christmas or their birthday. Um, I tend to, to buy a lot of books as presents for people because um, I, I think that there are many books that I uh, would like to talk to people about and that I hope that they read. but. Meditation is quite different in that when you really feel, oh, I, I want everyone to try this meditation, you literally feel that you want everyone to try it. Oh, I hope everyone can try. And um, I certainly think that anyone and everyone could meditate on upon meditation. Vipassana meditation has some limitations. It is... Uh, a bit more complex. It involves going to a residential course for 10 days. So there's more to that. But Anapan meditation, you can learn in 10 minutes and you can practice every day for the rest of your life. And so this idea of the, the agricultural laborers of Bashai Turu, they are as as far as was permitted in in the world of the 1970s they are slaves they are very much trapped and they have no privileges and they have no escape and they kind of embody this uh archetype the archetype of the underprivileged 
And so if you really want a meditation to be universally accessible, anyone can do this. Anyone can practice this. Anyone can learn this. Um, you need to think of that sort of archetype. Who are the people who are struggling just to survive? And could the meditation technique that I practice, that I think is so valuable, work for them? And I, I think that this is part of the value of Anapana and Vipassana meditation for me is that it is uh, globally available, Vipassana meditation, uh, Vipassana centers. And e even if you don't see, and although you do uh, see very poor people coming to Vipassana courses, um, you'll certainly hear about um, people from the lowest rungs of society who have um, found out about Vipassana meditation one way or another and applied for a course and done a course and found a lot of value in it. Um, and that matters to me quite a bit. I, I think that it's very important that um, a meditation technique, whether it be Anapan meditation or Vipassana meditation, or Zazen, or anything else, that it is accessible to these people, and that means a number of things. So it means that the people who are running a meditation course or operating meditation center are doing so with the intention of providing the meditation education to absolutely anyone who applies, absolutely anyone who comes. And it is then also a requirement that it is done for free. So anyone can come and uh, give nothing and take a 10-day Vipassana course. And when they leave, they're not expected to make a donation. They're not expected to do anything in particular. Now they have the meditation and good for them, then they can go meditate with it. Um, this, this quality, I think that it may also exist elsewhere. I'm not aware of a fully global uh, education system, systematic uh, meditation education system, such as Vipassana, uh, that does this entirely with a volunteer team and entirely for free. Um, but I think that it is uh, extremely valuable to um, evaluate whatever meditations you try in this regard. Um, and maybe not from the beginning, right? In the beginning, you're evaluating the meditation for yourself. Am I getting anything out of this? Is this valuable for me? You, if you don't get any, there are, I have tried meditations that I've, I've found no value in. And I don't finish those and think, oh, good, everyone should do this. Um, and so the idea that a meditation technique or a school for meditation or education materials for meditation should be entirely free and entirely available to anybody, um, that requirement only comes once you've found a meditation technique that is very valuable for you. Um, but uh, assuming that you will find a meditation technique that is that valuable for you, um, you will reach that stage where you are um, desperately hoping that not only the people that you know, but the people you don't know have an opportunity to learn the meditation technique as you have. So with that in mind, the, I also recommend uh, Bashai Turu. It is a good book. Um, it is a bit harder to read than some of Mahashweta Devi's other work, um, but it's, uh, it's interesting and it's given me a new perspective on uh, the various populations um, I don't have immediate access to here in India. So. 
um, think of the agricultural laborers and wish them well. Think of your meditation technique and whether or not it is universal. And I hope you are enjoying your Saturday and I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.